of us, let's open our Bibles now, chapter 1 of the book of John. John chapter 1. Let's read one verse. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So here comes the, the, uh, uh, John the Baptist. Seeing the Lord Jesus Christ coming towards him, and he called the attention of everyone and said, Behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And indeed, friends, we've been talking about the sins of this world uh, these past weeks. The, there will be terrible times in the last days that this world that we're living in is a troubled world where the devil is the prince of this world. Jesus himself said that the devil is the prince of this world. And he was telling those that don't believe in him, saying that, you have your father, the devil, the father that is a liar from the beginning. So this is Jesus declaring that there is another ruler of this world that we are living in, and that is the devil. And so we are told, friends, not to love the world. That's why in 1 John chapter 2, if we read it, we are told here, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So, we are told here, friends, that if the world is full of sin, if the world is troubled, then the command for us is don't love it. Because if you love it, then the love of the Father is not in you. So anything that God hates, don't hold on to those things. If he hates sins, then don't hold to sin. Because if you hold on to these things, we are told that for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires are passing away but the man who does the will of, the, of God lives forever. So we are told here that the world is passing away. If you are holding on to that world, when the world passes away, then you too will pass away. But we are told that, but the man of God, the one who does the will of the Father, will have eternal life. So that is where we are living, friends. So the command for us is not to love the world. And so here comes the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Peter emphasized that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. The Apostle Peter said, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So it's for our sake that the lamb of God has been revealed to us. The lamb who takes away the sins of the world. But for us to I appreciate again, friends, what is being discussed here as the Lamb of God. We get to go back to the beginning. We got to go back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament talks about a Lamb that has to be offered, and that is going back to the Passover. Even before we can go back to Passover in Exodus chapter 12, we got to go back to Exodus 11, and it talks about the last plague that came upon Egypt. And because of the hardness of the heart of Pharaoh, this plague came. Friends, this is the patience of God. God is patient. 
And he is willing, he is willing just to deal with us in our weaknesses. But let's not harden our hearts. Because Pharaoh was used as an example of the hardening of the hearts. You know, whenever we have problems, we are in trouble and we sin, what happens? We go to God and ask, oh God, please, release us from this trouble. Release us from this pain. And God will come and give us release. And yet, how do we respond after? How do we respond after? In the case of the, of the Pharaoh, it took him 10 plagues to learn his lesson. But that was a painful lesson he learned. See, the first few plagues, every time that there was a relief, every time that there is a comfort, he would harden his heart again. You know, whenever there is a problem, he would come and plead, please, please, release me, release me, Lord, release me. And God will release. But after, he would harden his heart. And many times, we are in the same situation, friends. We are good to God when we need something from the Lord. We need healing, we go to God, Lord, please heal me. When I get well, I will surely serve you. And God is gracious, and he would heal us. But when we are well, we forget him again. We don't serve him again. We go anywhere we want. Lord, if only you will give me this, I will do this. And God will give. But once we get it, we don't do what we promised to do. And so that's what happened to Pharaoh, because every time that there is a relief, he would harden his heart. So came the last plague. That's in Exodus 11, the plague of the firstborn, the death of the firstborn. And so every firstborn in the house has to die, whether you are a Jew or Gentile. See, whether you are a Jew, because the angel of death will come to its house, look for the firstborn in the house, and the firstborn will die, whether you are a Jew or you are a Gentile. So, if that is the case, what will happen to the Jews? They will also suffer. But last week, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. We talked about Noah. And in 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are told that God knows how to save the righteous. He knows how to save us. Amen. Does God know how to save? Of course he knows how to save us. That's why he saved Noah through the ark. He saved Lot by pushing them out of harm's way. They were saved. So here comes now the situation where God sent the angel of death. But how will God save the Jews? The Jews are his chosen people. And that is the reason why God wants them to come out of Egypt, forcing Pharaoh to release them. But how will God release or save them from the angel of death? Then the Passover came. That's why in Exodus 12, we now talk about the Passover, where he commanded the Israelites to bring a lamb without blemish, without defect, with a spotless lamb. See, what is acceptable to God as an offering is something that is without blemish, not your second-hand uh, offering, not your half-hearted service. No. He wants us the best. He wants from us the best, not the second best. And so he demanded from the Israelites, say that, okay, on this night the angel of death will come, but to you, this is your way out. This is your salvation. Bring a lamb, a spotless lamb, kill the lamb, and take the blood of the lamb, spread it on the doorpost of your door, on the frame of your door. It's apply, the, apply the blood so that when the angel of death comes and sees the blood, the angel of death will pass over your house. He won't enter your house. He will pass over it 
and go to the next house and check again. If the angel of death looks at the door and there is blood, again, pass over. But to every door that has no blood, the angel of death would go in and every firstborn in that house would die. That is the Passover. And it requires a lamb. And so here we come, having sinned against the Lord. What is the hope for us then? Because Romans 3, 23 says that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So all of us, just like both Israel and the Gentiles, exposed to the angel of death. So here we are. We are all subject to death because of the sin that we've committed. So what's the way out? That's why he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus, the blood that he shed on the cross. That's why Peter said that it is the blood of a lamb, a blameless lamb that Jesus shed on the cross. So it is by the blood of Jesus now applied in the heart of each one of us that angel of death shall pass over us. Amen. 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 So it is the angel of death, friends, that will come to kill. But thank be to God, we have the blood of Jesus applied in our hearts. The angel of death shall pass over us. We shall not die. That's why we said we have eternal life. Amen. Amen. So friends, this is where we are today. This is where we are today. There is salvation. There is salvation. We are not hopeless. God himself provided a way for us to be saved. Just like the Jews, he provided them with a way for them to be saved. And only those who did not believe, those died, including the Jews that did not believe. They died. So, meaning, all of us have been given the opportunity. All of us. Equal footing. We are in equal footing. We, are not, we don't have any advantage over others. Not because we are Filipinos, not because we are Canadians, that we have advantage over those that are living in the poor countries. No. We have the same opportunities to be saved. The only difference is, will we apply the blood of Jesus in our hearts? Will we receive him as Lord and Savior of our lives? If we will, then we are saved. If we don't, then we are not saved. Amen. And, of course, it goes back again to the time of Abraham. Because in the case of Abraham, he got a son. His only son, as far as God is concerned, well, we know that Abraham had other son, Ishmael. But before the eyes of God, he got only one son, the son of the promise, and that is Isaac. In Genesis chapter 22, we are told, friends, that when Isaac grew up to become a boy, he could carry wood, on his shoulder, God tested the faith of Abraham. He tested the faith of Abraham. Abraham, you are supposed to be a man of faith, a righteous man. Now, bring your son, your only son, Isaac. Take him to the mountain that will I show you. Take him there and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham did not question God. See, if you were Abraham, would you question God? Abraham at the time, well, more than 100 years old. And it was when he was 100 years old that he got a son, the promised son. And yet when the son was given, suddenly God said, come Abraham, the son that you now have, don't put your faith and trust in the son. You might say that now I have a son, somebody now can be my in, my, my, uh, uh, a son that will inherit everything that I possess. Maybe Abraham was so proud because he was looking for someone that will inherit 
his possessions. And God said that, no, I will give you one, your very own. And he waited for 100 years for it to come. Now this, the boy was there. So God said, now Abraham, you might be very happy now because you have a son. Maybe you said that someone now will inherit your possessions. Now you don't have problems. But come here. Take your son, go into the mountain, and offer him to me as a sacrifice. Friends, if you were Abraham, you got only one son, and you are old now. Will you do it? If I give you $100, and that's your only $100, and I said, give me your $100, will you give it? When you know that that's the only money you have, Will you? Well, in the case of Abraham, said, God, you gave this boy to me. You are asking him back. I am giving it to you. So he called the boy, let's go. And so together with a lot of uh, servants, they went up to the mountain. At a certain point, Abraham told the servants, stay here while me and the boy will go yonder and worship God, and we will come back. See the words of Abraham? He said to his servants, stay here, my servants. My son and myself will go up. We will worship the Lord, and we will come back. He said, we will come back. But, you know, he knew that he will offer his son. He knew that his son will die. But he said to his servants, but we will come back. It's a confession of faith. Believing that they will indeed come back together alive. So they went up. The altar was there. Abraham prepared the altar. And he tied the boy so the boy cannot run. Put the boy on the altar. Took the knife. And he was about to kill him to offer him a sacrifice to God. But when he raised his hand, friends, to kill the boy, what did God say? Genesis 22. Verse 14. Uh, verse 13. Oh, let's, let's go back to, to verse, uh, verse 12. You know what God said? Do not lay, hand, uh, lay a hand on the boy. He said, do, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So here comes God. When Abraham was about to kill his son to offer him, said, Abraham, Abraham, don't do that. Said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything. I only tested you. Now I know that you will not withhold anything that you have. Now I know that you fear me, that you worship me, that you know, I know, I know that you are a righteous man willing to sacrifice. And then verse 13, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So when he was about to kill his son, God said, Abraham, don't do it. Don't do, don't, no, 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 don't. Now I know that you are willing to give up your own. And so what did Abraham do? He looked around and he saw a ram in the ticket caught by its horn. And so Abraham went, took the ram, killed the ram, ram, ram killed the ram and offered it to God instead of his son, Isaac. Amen. Amen. That's how Isaac was saved. 
Amen. Amen. See the love of God. He loves us. He does not want that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, that all should be saved. That is the love of God. And it was manifested here that God provided a way. God provided a way by which Isaac will be saved, and that is true alone. Friends, you and me are like Isaac. We deserve to die. But Jesus came alone. A blameless lamb, he offered his body for our sins. Friends, the world is perishing. But God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what the scripture is telling us now. So that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is why, verse 14, so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. So friends, God provides. He provides for our salvation. He provides for our deliverance in the mountains of the Lord. How big is your problem? How tall is your problem? In the mountains of the Lord, there is deliverance. There is salvation. There is hope in the mountains of the Lord. So look at yourself. How, how high is the mountain that you have? How big is your problem? Is the Lord there in the, in the mountain with you? Friends, I, I had an experience like that. You know, I traveled to uh, Isabella in uh, my hometown one day uh, when Twinkle was about two years old. And, uh, you know, I love to drive at night in the Philippines at night. I, 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 I love to do my long driving at night. I don't want it daytime. At night, less traffic. And another thing, at night, because I get to pass through mountains. There are two mountains. The Sierra Madre Mountain and the Carvalho Mount, Car Mountain. Huh? Ah. Cordillera. Cordillera's Mountain. Two mountains get, get to, to pass before I reach my home. So, I would like, I, I really like to drive at night. Because, because it, it, 30 minutes of zigzag roads. So daytime, it's so hard, you know, you just don't know the oncoming car. You just don't see them because it was really zigzag like this. But at night, at least you see the lights of the oncoming car, so it's a lot easier. And so one day, we said, okay, let's go to Isabella. And so Twinkle, myself, Stermaira, went. Four o'clock in the morning, we were driving in the mountain. Started with the zigzag. Very fast, I was driving really fast because we want to reach home early. And suddenly, there was this oncoming bus, trans uh, passenger bus, with bright light, glaring light. And so, well, I, I was able to manage that. But the problem was, after the bus passed, you know what I saw? I saw a stone, a rock, at the middle of the road. A rock. And I said, what will I do? I only had a split second to make a decision. If I turn this way, I would hit the mountain. If I would turn that way, I would go down the ditch. It's steep. So where will be my salvation? Where will be my salvation? If I run the, 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 uh, the, the, the rock, well, my possessions, my precious car, it was about a new car, beautiful one, I like it, but I will wreck it. So what is more important to me then? My life 
or my car. A lot of people, friends, they would avoid those things just to save their possessions. Well, in my case, I said, this is just a car. I run through it. I don't care. If I do this, I will kill myself. I kill my, my wife, my beautiful wife. Wow, I am not willing to sacrifice my wife, and especially my beautiful baby. I won't sacrifice those. I would rather give up my possessions. And so I said, okay. And then they were sleeping. A split second, friends. I said, Lord! I closed my eyes, boom! Boom, boom. Wow. I told you, friends, the car almost, it was flying. Because I didn't have time to really stop. Boom. And so then I stopped it. Went down to check the car. Looked down, oil. And I said, we were at the mountain. Up there, nobody, no, who could help out there, help us there? And so I said, Sister Mara, the car is wrecked. What will we do? We just have to pray. We just got to pray. And so, but before, before the, car, the, the, the passenger, passenger bus came, I noticed that there was a small shack, like a, a house on the left, uh, by, by the cliff. And as if, the, as if I saw a, a, a jeep parked in it, in front of that house. And so I told Tamara, let's turn back, because the car was still running. No more oil. It's still running. And so let, we turned back slowly. It was night. Everybody was sleeping. So I said, okay, let's stay here. Let's pray. Let's wait for the morning. See, in our life, friends, there would be nighttime, so dark. But remember that there is always a morning. So I said, let's wait for the morning. So early that morning, I was watching that house, and a lady came out, a lady. So I said, Stemara, wait here. Let me check with the lady if somebody can help us. And I ran to the lady. And I said, did you hear what happened last night? No, we were sleeping. I hit a rock and my car was wrecked. And see, I, I just need help and my car, for, with my car. And you know what the lady said? Well, well, see this jeep? The passengers of this jeep, they are all Car mechanics, they are all car mechanics. The ones that, uh, that packed the jeep there, they were just sleeping overnight in her house. They are all car mechanics. In the mountains, where, where can you find a mechanic? God provides. Amen. He provides. He provided. There was a car mechanic there. And so I said, just wait. When they, when they wake up, I call you, or I tell them. And so I went back, now I could sleep. Earlier, I could not sleep, friends. Early, very early in the morning, I was so tired. And now I was able to sleep, and then came the lady, said, okay, these are the... And so I went and said, you know, I have a problem. Last night, I hit a rock, a big rock. And, you know, the chief, the chief engineer said, okay, wake that guy up. The, the guy was still sleeping. Say, wake that guy up. And they walked that guy and said, okay, walk on the car. And so, friends, <laughs> just woke up. He went under the car and tried to fix it using what? A wood. Say, so, oh, there, you know, you know, the oil pan was broken. That's why the oil came out. And he was trying to patch it with the wood, a piece of wood. A crazy man. And then the, the engineer said, so what's wrong? Well, uh, you know, it, there, there is a leak here. 
So what are you doing? I'm trying to pass it with the wood. So are you crazy? Come out. And so the engineer called the guy. Say, you go take your breakfast now. Go. Say, why are you doing that? You cannot do that. See, it's supposed to be a mechanic, auto mechanic. But you know what happened? He said, okay, we'll take our breakfast. It might take us about 30 minutes. What we will do is this. I give you oil. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Amen. Those songs, you know, they just came alive during those times. Because the man said that, you know, I have four, four liters of oil here with me in the jeep. I'll put it in your car. It start it because your car is good. It's fine. We check it. It's fine. Put the oil. It start it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Go straight to the city, the next city, or go back to the city, uh, San Jose. Maybe see her. Go back to San Jose. And go to a store, a hardware store, and buy an epoxy. Epoxy. Five minutes epoxy. The first time that I have heard about epoxy. I've never heard about epoxy before, what it can do. So friends, they fixed my car. But he said, no stopping. Friends, our journey, if you want to reach your destination, no stopping. That was the instruction, don't stop. Drive as fast as you can. Don't stop. Once you get there, we'll be there. And I told Sister Mara, will they come? I, I, already, I already bought the, uh, the epoxy. And he said that go to this place, you know, go to a, a, a gasoline station where they have a lift in a bay. Uh, go to that place and we'll be there. Friends, many times the Lord has instructions like this. Would you do it? Will they come? And that was the question of my, in my mind. Will they come? Will they help? And how much will I pay when they come? Knowing that, you know, I was desperate. I was desperate for help. Will they take advantage of the situation? Friends, I drove to the store, get everything that I need, went to the uh, gasoline station, and we waited and waited and waited. And we were praying, will they come, will they come? You know, in, in, in San Jose, there were about a dozen of gas stations, or even more. And we happened to have picked one that was remote. Will they find us here? And so we were there. By then, we were hungry, waited and praying. Suddenly, they came. They came. And they said, okay, did you buy? Say, okay, here's the epoxy. These are the oil. They fix it. They clean the, the car. And after that, they said, okay, you go. How much do I have to pay? Say, no, don't pay us. No, it's free. Friends, Jesus, when he was given to us, it's free. We just have to run the race. We just have to wait. Will he come? He will come. Amen. We were waiting. We didn't know whether they'd come because they got to look for the place. They didn't tell us which station. So just go look for a station and wait for us there. They came. They fixed it. And they said, you go. Can I now go to Isabella? Yes, go. There's no problem with your car. Friends, this is our salvation. Amen. Is there any problem with you? There's nothing. Who can fix it? The Lord can fix it. Will you do it? Will you wait? Friends, if we wait, we will get it. Amen. Supposing I didn't wait. Supposing we just left. Supposing we didn't believe in the man. Friends, we were stuck there in the mountain. 
but because we believe, because we ask God to provide. In the mountains of the Lord, the Lord provides. So what problem do you have? <laughs> what problem do you have? How big is your problem? There is no problem to be. God cannot solve it. Come on, let's say. There is no mountain too tall. God cannot move it. There is no storm too dark. God cannot come in. There is no sorrow to deep. God cannot soothe it. If he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know, dear brother, that he will carry you. Amen. That is our God. There is no problem too big that he cannot solve. There is no mountain too tall that he cannot move. There is no storm too dark that he cannot calm. And there is no sorrow to deep friends that he cannot soothe. That is the God that we're serving. This is the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I have seen it with my own eyes, what he can do in the mountains. I have experienced it, and he is able to save. And this is my confidence, friends, in serving him, so that even when I am in the mountains, I am always assured that in the mountains of the Lord, he will provide. Let's stand up. Let's pray.